حضرات وقت کی مناسبت سے اب میں بلا تاخیر دعوت خطاب دیتا ہوں حضرت علامہ صاحبزادہ بیرسٹر زین الطاب صدیقی صاحب کو کہ وہ تشریف لائیں اور اپنے نورانی بیان سے ہمارے قلوب و ازہان کو منور فرمائیں نعرہ تکبیر نعرہ رسالت علماء اہل سنت as a body of knowledge like many other knowledges science is not a master of this universe it is a servant of this universe but who does it serve it serves allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> but according to which law does it serve according to which law the law of england doesn't apply in the law in the country of pakistan every country has a system of law given by its governor 
given by its ruler, given by its person of authority. Science is not a master, science is a servant. So which law regulates science after all? Who does science account to in the regulation and in its functioning? The answer is science in its regulation and in its performance is accountable to the Prophet that is the Prophet of this universe and his name is Muhammad Rasulullah Therefore science is a servant of Rasulullah and is subservient to him in the capacity of a Ummati. Ummati is not higher in status than a Nabi and Nabi is higher than a Ummati. Why did I establish this basis as the foundation to my discussion. Why? Because in the day and age that we live, there are many gadgets that are in the marketplace and the person who knows best about those gadgets, who is that person? Uh, no, no. <laughs> who gives Google the knowledge? Google is the Masila. But who gives Google that knowledge? Who provides that knowledge? All these gadgetries. Who has the knowledge of that gadgetry? Think. It's the one who created the gadget. He knows the gadget the best, isn't it? Then he tells Google, he tells the instruction, he tells the manufacturer, he tells the salesperson, he tells everyone. But the fountain of knowledge for any gadgetry is the manufacturer, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah is the manufacturer of this universe. And his views of life and death are more authoritative than my view and your view. Science has a view of life, but cannot understand the extent of that view. For example, you have a dead body in front of you and you ask the best doctor or the best doctors in the world, can you revive this body? They will say, why? They will say, no, why? The heart is there, the kidney is there, the liver is there, the body is there, the blood is there, the brain is there, everything is there. But the best doctor will not revive that body. Why? Because the body is dead. The doctor will say, sorry, my science has now come to an end because there is no soul in this body. But the question is, what has science got to do with the soul? How much does science know about the soul? In the MBBS degree, how many units are covered on the understanding of the soul? None. <laughs> the beauty is, science is so advanced, but can't operate without the soul. So the understanding of the soul and its relationship to the body is the extent of the understanding of the soul. If the soul is in, science says living. If the soul is out, the science, uh, science says but that is not the case as far as the manufacturer is concerned. Why? Because the manufacturer says when you go to sleep at night, do you know what happens when you go to sleep? Yes. Some of you snore, some of you don't know where you are, on Mars, Jupiter, wherever. But the manufacturer says when you go to sleep, your soul leaves the body. Your soul? So the manufacturer says your body doesn't need the soul. Your body can carry on operating without that. Has anyone said to a person who's asleep, he's dead? Even if he's really in deep sleep, no one says, oh, he's dead, just bury him. <laughs> no. Why? Because no matter how much deep sleep there is, science will say that even though we cannot see the presence or absence of the soul, we still say that he is alive. Allah, the manufacturer, says, you may know that the soul is not in the body, it's out the body, but he's still alive. But remember, 
your measure of life is the presence or the absence of the soul. The measure of science for life is the presence or absence of the soul. That is why all the ulama mutakallimin, ranging from Sahib al Kashaf or Fakhruddin Razi, all of the mutakallimin, they reduce the definition of life to the presence or the absence of the soul. But the manufacturer, but those mutakallim who did the mutakallimin who did that, they were correct. Why? Because Sharia has to extract hukam, order, from uh, 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 the uh, uh, state of the body. But the manufacturer has given us a different dimension to life and death. He says, there are people who are walking and talking. And the manufacturer says, don't look at their walking, don't look at their talking, don't look at their sleeping, don't look at their eating. Why? He announces, Oh my beloved, you talk to these people, they listen to you, they walk, they talk, but beloved, I, their manufacturer, declare they are not living, they are dead people. Ajeeb. They look, they talk, they function as normal. But Allah says, Inna kala tusmi'ul mawta. They are dead. They have souls in their body, but their manufacturer says they are dead. And on the other hand, you have a dead body in front of you. Everyone says, let's prepare for namaz janazah. But Allah announces, Wala tahsaban alladhina qutilu fi sabilillahi amwata Bal ahyaun inda rabbihim yurzaqu manufacturer says in front of you is a dead body but don't think this dead body is dead don't think this dead body is look at the wording of the uh, uh, statement don't even think because some nincompoops translated this that maybe don't say or think out of respect but this is not a question of respect. This is not an expression of love or an expression of emotion. This is an expression of reality. And Allah does not exaggerate. Don't even think. But this thinking is associated to the mind. Sojne ka mahle waku, the center for thinking and processing thought is where? Where? For most people. <laughs> but Imam Ahmad Raza says a very different concept here. Rahimahullah. He says, I'm slightly digressing from the topic. He says, Pirke gali gali taba. Someone should have said to Imam Muhammad Raza Rahimahullah, this is the place of the heart. This is the place of the This is the place of the But there is one akal in your brain and there is one akal in your heart. But some other time we'll talk about this. Now Allah is talking about your mind. He's not talking about the akal here. But if I translate this verse into, not translate, if I transmit the message of this verse into plain, or should I say street English, maybe you'll understand what Allah is saying, or the, 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 the way Allah is describing this uh, subject. In another verse, Allah says, don't say. But here He says, You know, when you can't think of something, when you haven't got the brain to think of it, in common street English, it's often said, don't even go there. Don't even. So this is Allah's way of saying, don't even go there. This is not your forte. Your akal has limitations. Why? 
Because I am the manufacturer. I decide who is living and I decide who is dead. These were walking, talking people. I gave fatwa that they are not living, they are dead. But these people who are ready for now being the subject of namaz and janaza, I declare that they are not dead, they are. And what is the dalil? Alive because their sustenance, their sustenance has been catered for by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Science has shown that you can op you can conduct the body without the full assistance of the heart through the pacemaker, you can have dialysis, you can conduct different organs of the body without the organs themselves in a way that scientific technology has boasted about but no one has claimed that this body is able to conduct itself without sustenance Allah says listen your body requires sustenance for its continued existence and I have declared the life of a shaheed based on the fact that whilst a person dies he no longer <coughs> needs sustenance. Has anyone gone to a funeral with some food for the mayat? I mean, have you ever buried a mayat with a pizza? Well, maybe you'd be hungry under that. No, because the process of sustenance is something that is associated to the body. The root doesn't need sustenance, right? The root doesn't need sustenance. So Allah educates us that their living is demonstrated by the fact that because the body needs sustenance now they will not cater for their sustenance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide sustenance to their body and so therefore this is the dalil of their living this is the evidence of their living however now let's evaluate the statement why because we often say no no they are living out of respect but I often say that we undermine the status of people who are dead and say that their being dead, our life is better than their death. But if you look at it in the paradox of the Quran and Sunnah, a new picture will emerge. And what is that picture? Look, can anyone in this audience put their ear to the uh, floor and hear six feet beneath the floor what's happening? Can you hear? Without technology, of course, even with the best of hearing aids. You can't hear, your hearing is incapable of allowing you to hear what's going on six feet, seven feet beneath the floor. But let's not talk about a shaheed, let's talk about an ordinary person in their grave. The Prophet ﷺ said that when a person is buried, the person in the grave, whether he's a mu'min or whether he's a kafir, he can hear the footsteps of people walking in the graveyard. So whose hearing is better, your hearing or the hearing of the people of the grave? So is the your hearing demoted or promoted when you go in the grave? D promoted, right? Now let's look at seeing. Not only hearing noises, maybe the footsteps is... No, but deciphering those noises, understanding those noises. He said the noises of the footstep. Is it just noises or can they understand the significance of those noises? The Prophet ﷺ said, when you go to graveyards, don't look at bricks, don't look at mortar, don't look at sand, don't look at cement, don't look at the earth, but you should spontaneously say, Assalamu alaikum ya ahl al qubur Salam upon you, O people of the graves. Why you don't say salam to bricks and mortar, you say salam to the people of the grave. Why? Because they hear your salam and they respond to your salam. They hear and they respond. If they couldn't hear, why say salam to them in the first place? 
then if they say salam to us, why can't we, uh, why can't we hear that? Wa alaykum as salam. Because the hadith and the matan of the hadith, which has been accredited by many muhaddisin in many asas, through many asanid, is that idha samia sayaka. If you heard their voice, the caliber of the decibels and the hertz of their voice is of such magnitude that if you heard their voice, you would faint as a result of hearing. But just because you can't hear their voice, it doesn't mean to say that you disregard their wa alaykum as salam because your duty as a mu'min is when you meet a mu'min who is in front of you, you say salam to him. And when you visit his grave, he can hear you and he can respond to you. So tell me, is your hearing demoted when you go in the grave or it is promoted? This is an ordinary person. This is not a shaheed yet. Shaheed is well above this status. And then finally, Imam Jalaluddin Siyuti in his book Shah Sudul Fi Ahwal al Mota al Qabul brings many, many ahadith on this subject that when you go to the grave of your father, when you go to the grave of your grandfather, when you go to the grave of your great grandfather, don't just think that you go there, pay your respects, send these Salah Sahab and come back. No! When you go to their grave, they look at you, they recognize you and they say to the person in their next door grave look my grandson has come to visit me look my great grandson has come to visit me so they not only look at you they know you they recognize you so tell me does your ability to see decrease when you go in the grave or does it increase and this is not the talk of a shaheed this is the talk of an ordinary person then what must the state of a shaheed be can you imagine this isn't a statement of respect, and that I'm a no out of respect. When we say they are living, their body could be disseminated in 1000 pieces. Whichever piece you pick up, you must acknowledge that this limb has been severed from its source, but this limb is not dead. Every limb of the body of Shaheed is. Every limb of a shaheed is. But despite that, you read the Mazah Janazah, don't you? Can I ask you a Musla? Is it permissible to read the Mazah Janazah of a living person? Come on. There's no ikhtilaf in this. Is there any school or fiqh that says you can read the Mazah Janazah of a living person? Then why do you read the Namaz and Janazah of a Shaheed? Is a Shaheed living or dead? Ah, you see, now there's a dilemma here. Allah says the Shaheed is, and you said Namaz and Janazah is for? So then why are you reading Namaz and Janazah? Number two, when a person dies, his wife, if he's married, is eligible for remarriage after Idda. Correct? After the period of waiting, she is eligible because the nikah now no longer subsists. So she is free to remarry. Can a woman who is in the nikah of a normal living person remarry in his presence without divorce? She needs divorce. Then why is it that after a period of idda? That a woman who is the wife of a shaheed, she can get remarried. Question. Third question. Why is it that when a person dies, if he has two properties, those properties are distributed, isn't it? Tarka, they call it. Tarka, the estate is distributed. But you don't distribute the estate of someone who is living, right? Or do you? I'm not talking about bankruptcy. <laughs> Because there you have the uh, uh, relative of Murkul Maud, the trustee in bankruptcy. He's a relative because all he does is slice and dice the estate. But I'm not talking about bankruptcy. I'm talking about when a person is living, can you distribute his estate? Then why is it that you distribute the estate of the Shaheed? Now we have a dilemma. We go to the ulama and we say, Allah says he is living. You say he is living on the mimbar. You distribute his estate, you allow his wife to remarry, and you read his namaz and janazah. The ulama will respond to this dilemma by saying that, listen, 
sometimes Sharia has a different policy to Hakikat. Sometimes the policy of Sharia is different to the reality of Hakikat. Why? Because if Hakikat was allowed to prevail and someone died in the way of Allah and was allowed to function normally as any normal human being, then no one would be a kafir. But Sharia has its own policy. Sharia has its own purpose. Those purposes we may not be able to subscribe to. I often give this example just to explain. You have a red traffic light, a pedestrian light in front of you. What is the objective of a pedestrian light? What is the objective? Come on, I mean, you don't need any rocket science to work that out. I mean, not even the highway code. What's the objective of a pedestrian light? Safety of pedestrians. I'm not talking about the other traffic light. I'm talking about pedestrian light. The object of a pedestrian light is the preservation of the safety of the pedestrian. But if there is no pedestrian and you go through red traffic lights, is this justified? And if a police officer catches you then? Three points, 60 pounds fine? Minimum. And that's if you don't have a magistrate who's got on the, uh, the wrong side of bed. It could increase. But the question that you ask the magistrate is this. Sir, the pedestrian light was for pedestrians. There was no pedestrian. So where's the danger? The magistrates will say, listen son, don't try to be funny with me. When the light is red, whether your intellect appreciates it or not, the law says you must stop. You are not stopping for the pedestrian, you are stopping for the law. Why? Because the law doesn't subscribe to reality. The law subscribes to its own policy. And the policy of law is when the law says something, there is a hikmah behind it. That is why when a shaheed dies in the way of Allah, Allah says he is not dead, he is. But we still read his namaz al We still distribute his estate. We still call his wife a widower. Because the ulama say the shaheed is haqiqatan zinda but hukman murda. In fact, he is alive, but in law he is dead. In fact, he is alive, but in law he is. Now we looked at the grave a mom, a kafir, a momin, and now a shaheed. In fact, the shaheed's life is better than the life of a momin or a kafir in his grave. But this is the life of the Shaheed. In fact, he is alive, but in law he is. But this is the state of a Shaheed. What about someone who's higher than a Shaheed? Who is higher than a Shaheed? The Imam of a Shaheed, Anbiya alayhi salam. Why? Because when it comes to the Prophets, there is a Hadith, time doesn't permit, in Allah ala al-ard. Even their bodies are preserved. It is haram for the earth to touch their bodies. But now as a state of comparison, here the Shaheed is now the recipient of namaz janazah Because in fact he is alive and in law he is. But when it came to the namaz janazah of Rasulullah no companion stood up and read namaz janazah Why? Why do you not read namaz e janaza of a prophet? What do you read, by the way, when you read namaz e janaza? What's the dua? Allahumma ghfir. Oh Allah, forgive his sins. The Sahaba knew. We don't need to ask for forgiveness. Why? We are, have in front of us someone who is incapable of sinning. In fact, to even infer sin to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is kufr. That's why there was no namaz e janaza. And therefore, when he passed away, his wives were likewise ineligible for remarriage. Yet who said they could not marry? They did not marry. Why? Because the ruling was different. His estate likewise wasn't distributed. Why? The ulama say the reason is because the caliber of the life of a Nabi because a Nabi is a Muqtadi and a Nabi is a Muqtada Nabi is the Imam Shaheed is the follower how can the life of a Shaheed be the same of a Nabi the Nabi passes away his namaz and janazah is not done his widow is his wife is not eligible for remarriage 
and his estate is not distributed. Why? Because a Nabi is alive in fact and he is alive in law. Therefore, the caliber of the life of a Nabi is far greater than that of a Shaheed. But coming back to their life, why have I mentioned this? Because in this day and age, we consider death to be a demotion. But even the death of a normal person is not a demotion. Because the hearing increases, the uh, uh, seeing increases, the faculties of intellect increase then how can it be a demotion of an ordinary person? Then how can we suggest that when a Shaheed passes away, he is of no consequence. He is not only spiritually alive, but he is physically alive. And the nature of his physical life is of such caliber that when Imam Hussein, Radhi Allah, Ibn Asakin narrates this hadith, when his head was being paraded in the streets of Kufa, a Qari was sat on a balcony reciting a verse of the Quran. A Qari was sat reciting a verse. What was he saying? He was saying the verse of the Quran. Anna ashab al kahfi warraqimi kanu min ayatina ajaba. that the Ashab Kahf and the Laqim, Laqim, there's many different meanings to this. Some have meant the, the dog, some have referred to it as the writings on the wall, whatever. Ashab Kahf were awliya and those associated to them, Laqim, Allah says, don't think that they are ordinary, they are extraordinary signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Awliya are extraordinary signs of Allah, not ordinary, extraordinary signs of Allah. Min ayatina ajaba. When the Qari was reciting this at the balcony on the streets of Kufa, the people witnessed that the head of Imam Hussein was being paraded to show the demise of Imam Hussein. But those who were able to witness saw his beautiful lips move. And when he heard this verse, those lips moved and they uttered the verse, the statement In The martyrdom of Hussein is even a greater sign than the Ashab Kaf. You think the Ashab Kaf? is an extraordinary sign of Allah. The lips of Imam Hussain, even having been severed from the body several days after, testify that the martyrdom of Imam Hussain is a greater, extraordinary sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the severance of the limbs is not a hallmark of death. It is a symbol of for the shuhada, it is a symbol to show that they have the ability to do the sarruf, to have an impact on any limb of their body if they choose to do so with the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why there's those who were shuhada, the only reason why they were not allowed to come back and conduct normal life was because if that was the case, then no one would be a kafir. Everyone would say that's fine. But if we make a, uh, if we uh, uh, equate death with misery, sakrat, naza, all of these things, then why is it that the shaheed has no hesitation? Because on the day of judgment, when a shaheed who is guaranteed a place in Jannah is asked, now go to Jannah. His dua is, oh Allah, before I enter this beautiful place known as Jannah, let me experience something even more beautiful than Jannah. Let me go back to the earth and re-experience martyrdom. Why? 
what is in martyrdom that is not in Jannah? The Shaheed will say that the state and the peace and the tranquility that I found giving my life in the way of Allah. I swear, I know what is Jannah. Jannah and the, and the beauty of Jannah is not hidden from me. I know what is Jannah. Why? Because the Hadith says that the Shaheed experiences the physicality of the Jannah by going into the body of blue birds in Jannah or green birds according to some ahadith. So a shaheed knows the caliber of Jannah but on that day he puts Jannah to one side and he says oh Allah I want to now re-experience this because this experience is greater than Jannah. In this experience I experience your majesty. There is no guarantee in Jannah I will experience your majesty. So we are now shy of shahada because we think that this is a demotion. But in fact, it is not only a spiritual promotion, it is a physical promotion. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved the body of Shaheed. But just before going, I want to just say one point because a lot can be said about Karbala and a lot has been said. I want to explain the fiqhi importance of Imam Hussein. Because some people say, yes, he was the relative, he was this. And of course, on account of being a relative, there is an automatic physical assumption. But I'm going to require 100% attention of yours. If you're not 100%, you'll miss my point. Do I have 100%? Yes. Right then. Last point. The fiqhi significance of Imam Hussein. The, is, the significance in Islamic law. Because you see, Imam Hussein wasn't just important on account of his uh, 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 um, uh, status or on account of his... There was a link which gave him a certain status. And I hope this points towards uh, uh, understanding the caliber that the Sharia attaches to ahl -e Forget about what we attach to ahl -e The Sharia attaches a certain caliber to the ahl -e Let me start off with this masla. The masla, and in order to understand the backdrop of this, uh, you'll need to understand this masla. The masla is when you uh, 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 defer or when you prolong or miss something that is wajib in your salah, what should you do? If you miss your that which is wajib, what do you do? And if you delay the performance of wujub in your salah, what must you do? Sayyidah sahab. Right? You delayed it. Sayyidah sahab. <coughs> Everyone happy with this masala? If you miss or delay wajib, there is Sayyidah sahab. Everyone happy with this masala? What do you say when you say Allahu Akbar? What's the first thing you say? Come on. Sana. What is Sana? What is the legal status of Sana? No, no, that's the, the, the meaning of it. What is the legal status? Is Sana Fars? Is it Wajib? Sunnah? What is the status of it? It's Sunnah. It is Sunnah. Then after that, what is what comes after Sana? La salata illa Fatiha til kitab Fatiha What is Fatiha? Fars, Wajib or Sunnah? According to Imam Azam Abu Hanifa Fatiha is Wajib now after and if you delay your Wajib what is the Masla? So Nothing must come in between you and Wajib. You say Allahu Akbar, you should say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. What is first? That's Sunnah. Why have you delayed Wajib for Sunnah? Masla Samaj Do you understand the Masla? Nothing should cause you to delay the performance of Wajib. Everyone happy with this Masla? Sometimes it's good to tax your mind. I mean, from my recollection of this mosque, the langar is very uh, um, high in protein and uh, <laughs> rich in sugar. So sometimes it's good to tax your mind. <laughs> so, uh, Sana is Sunnah. Fatiha is Wajib. Why did you delay Fatiha? The rule is according 
to fuqaha, if you have delayed your wajib, then you must do sajda sahaf. But why? The fuqaha will tell you, don't worry, don't worry. What is sana? Sana is praise of Allah. Praise of Allah does not obstruct, is not a cause of delay for your wajib. It doesn't obstruct. Sana wujub me hail nahi hoti. Sana does not interfere in the performance of your wujub. Otherwise, if it was an obstruction, then Sanda Sahib would be there. <coughs> yes, sir. Has everyone understood this? <laughs> Praising Allah does not obstruct the performance of your wujub. If something obstructs it, then it's Sanda Sahib. In that case, then everyone should do Sajda Sahib after every namaz. But no, Fuqaha say, don't worry. <coughs> Sana is praise of Allah. And by praising Allah, it doesn't obstruct. It doesn't obstruct the performance of your wajib. Likewise, according to Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahimahullah, if in tashahud, you should stand up in your salah, at this juncture, instead of standing up, you now recite durood on the Prophet ﷺ. Standing up was wajib. And reading durood wasn't wajib. But if you read durood, now you should read Sayyidah Sahab. Many Aima were very surprised by this masla. That reading durood on the Prophet ﷺ obstructs the wajib. But no, when Imam Azam was confronted on this masla, he responded, I say that you must not sit and read durood. And if you have read durood, you must do Sayyidah Sahab. Why? Because the fiqh of Imam Azam does not tolerate the reading of durood on the Prophet ﷺ with an absent mind. It requires the mind of presence. It requires the ability to know that when you say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, when your words are being said, they are being transmitted to Gumbad al Khazra. <laughs> Therefore, durood read by mistake is not durood. Durood is only durood when you intend to read durood. So, but as a masla, the fact of the matter is that that which is prescribed by the Prophet ﷺ, whether it is sunnah, it does not obstruct the performance of wajib. Now I come on to Imam Hussein and we finish on this point. Are you ready for this? Everyone? Yeah. Or should I? Next time, inshallah. <laughs> <coughs> Some of you will say we won't be able to digest that uh, scrumptious banquet after, after this occasion. Anyway, let me give you a picture in your mind of Salah. This is of Salah. When you go into Sajda, how many tasbihat must you do? Minimum? Maximum? So there's a minimum and there's a maximum, right? Minimum and? <laughs> so if a person says, I'm in a good mood today, oh, chalo ji, so It doesn't matter. <laughs> no, is that, is that uh, possible? Is it permissible? But you could be in a good mood, you say, oh Allah, I'm in a good mood today. Forget three times, forget 11 times, I'm going to do 101 times today. Is that permissible? No, it's bidah. It's not permissible. Why? Because that which has been prescribed must be kept to. So you have a minimum and you have a? And if you exceed the maximum, what is the penalty for that? Mm. Why? Because when you have read the prescribed amount, now it is wajib for you to rise. And if you have not risen, you have delayed your wajib. You have delayed your wajib. And therefore, Sajda Sahib is now paramount. It is absolutely paramount that you perform Sajda Sahib. But now let's paint a picture in Masjid al Nabawi. Everyone say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Everyone say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is a picture where the Prophet ﷺ is reciting Salah, is reading Salah, behind him are Sahaba. He goes into Sajda, and when he goes into Sajda, he prolongs the Sajda. 
the Sahabi of the Prophet are behind him. They prolong the Sajda. No one moves because they know if he has prolonged it. We were told the minimum and maximum by him. And if he wants to prolong and change the maximum, he is the lawgiver. But one Sahabi thought, mm, the maximum has been exceeded. Let me just pop my head up and find out what's happening. What's the reason? Huh? But Imam Sahib, if he does a very long say that, you're going to get worried, aren't you? He said, what's going on? No. At this juncture, one Sahabi lifted his head up from Sajda. And what did he see? He saw a child sitting on the neck of the Sallallahu But this wasn't any ordinary child. This was Imam Hussein. Now in his mind, he thought, shall I remove this child? Because after all, he is only a child. Shall I remove him? He is obstructing. He is obstructing the performance of wujub. He is obstructing salah. But then he thought, this is the masla. Maybe I should remove him. But his heart said to him, Oi, why are you going to move him? If he needed to be moved, Rasulullah would have moved him. He thought to himself, why should I move him? If the master himself hasn't moved him, then why should I move him? The fact that he raised his head is dalil that there was ta'khir in sajda. Do you see the point? The fact that he raised his head is dalil that there was a delay in his sajda. Then what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He waited. He waited until a time when Imam Hussain was sitting on his shoulders. He waited. And when Imam, you know the children when they play around, he was playing in the mosque. He waited. When Imam Hussain was sat on his Nana's shoulder, shoulders in sajda, when he decided, right, now I think I'm going to carry on playing. He got off and he carried on. Now what's the masla? Vajib has been the subject of delay. But Rasulullah did not, did not do Sajda Sahab. He did not do Sajda Sahab. And what was he teaching to his Ummah? Oh Ummah, when you say Salah, when you do the Salah of Allah, it does not obstruct the performance of your wujub. And if I have allowed Imam Hussain to stay on my shoulders, why? Because it was his will to stay on my shoulders. Therefore, the will of Imam Hussain does not prevent or obstruct the performance of wujub. This is a masla promulgated by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Razai Hussain takmile wajib ya ta'khire wajib me hail nahi hoti. It does not obstruct the performance of wajib. Why? This is the physical status that Sharia applies upon Sayyidina Imam Hussain. That his will and this is the jumla that I want to leave you by. That if his will is accredited, acknowledged, and promulgated by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to be a non-obstacle for Sharia, then how is it possible that his will in Karbala could have been counterproductive to the future and status of Deen of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? And I leave you words that today the law permits you to use self-defense if you are the subject of uh, persecution or an onslaught the law allows you to use self-defense in fact if a woman is suffering from a background of uh, 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 torment and she murders her husband. English law acknowledges that she will not be tried for murder. She will be tried for manslaughter on account of diminished responsibility. My question to you, my dear audience, is this. Self-defense. Every Sharia in the law, <coughs> every Sharia in the world permits self-defense. Then why was it? That Imam Hussain, radiallahu an, did he not have the spiritual might to defeat the army of Yazid? His great 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 grandson, he claims, Nazartu ila biladillahi jaman, 
says, I see this whole universe on the palm of my hand like a mustard seed. This is the state of the grandson, then what must the state of the grandfather be? I often ask that couldn't Imam Hussein have used his spiritual powers against Yazid? Could he not have used in self-defense to protect innocent lives? Could he not have used his self-defense in self-defense, his spiritual powers? No, he had powers through one ishara. He could have wiped out the armies of Yazid. But no, he did not refer to spiritual powers. He said, this is a matter of deen. And I want to teach the Ummah of Rasulullah When you are confronted with tyrants, don't revert to your spiritual power. Refer to your spiritual, uh, physical power and use your sp physical power to the best of your extent, to the best of your ability in confronting the enemies of your deen. Today, the status is this. When we have an enemy, forget about physical power, we run to people who say, can you use your spiritual powers for me, please? And the person sitting on the other side says, yes. 55 quid plus VAT. <laughs> We're willing to do absolutely. Imam Hussain ke paas ko taweez nahi the. Nahi, mera matlab ye jitna bhi sara hai muad, unke paas ko taweez nahi the. Ki wo Yazid ke matlab jaiz hai khabiz tha. Why not? Or did he not have some amliyat or varai or harad or some readings? Why did he not use them? Because he wanted to teach us. When you are faced with a tyrant, don't run away. Confront the tyrant with the best of your ability because even if you are defeated, it is not your defeat, it is your victory. That is why today the world of Haq celebrates the victory of Hussein and the defeat of Yazid. And one person came to my father, Alhamdulillah, and he said, Oh, he was, Yazid was Amir al Mu'minin, he was very good person, Imam Hussein, he was very. He was, my father, Alhamdulillah, was in a, in a hurry. He had to go somewhere. He said, I tell you what, I haven't got time to argue for you. Lift up your hands. He said, what? He said, lift up your hands. He said, for what? He said, do dua. You do dua, I'll do dua. He said, what dua? He said, you do dua, O oh Allah, on the day of judgment, resurrect me with Yazid. And I will do dua, O oh Allah, resurrect me with Imam Hussain. He said, no, no, I'm not going to do that dua. He said, if you can't stand to be resurrected with that idiot on the day of judgment, then on what basis do you justify his position in this world? Therefore, be with Haq, be with Hussein, wa ma alayna ayla. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha.